Sharpen. Masters of Surgical Education. Hi, I'm Samuel George, a consultant plastic surgeon. I specialize in hand surgery and peripheral nerve surgery. And I'm going to teach you today how to examine the median nerve. So median nerve examination is centered around really a compression pathology like carpal tunnel syndrome. So how do you do this in the exam and how do you do this in clinic? So a lot of people will examine the median nerve in terms of the territory that it supplies. So the radial three and a half fingers. So you would supply, you examine sensation here, 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 and here, and then you would do a Tinell's or a Phelan's test. And that's what we kind of learned in med school. Uh, but this is not entirely accurate because the median nerve, obviously, as you know, comes from the brachial plexus. So the upper trunk, middle trunk, and lower trunk then form the cords. And then the lateral cord and the medial cord both contribute to the median nerve. And then it comes down your arm. Now, the median nerve can get compressed at various levels. The roots of the median nerve can get compressed right in the spine from degenerative arthritis. The thoracic outlet can compress some elements of the median nerve. The median nerve can get compressed in your arm through something called the ligament of Struthers. And then the median nerve can get compressed in the forearm, which is another common site of compression. This can be from the Lysertus fibrosis, which is the aponeurosis of the biceps. It can be from the two heads of the pronator quadratus or the FDS arch, which forms a very firm fascial band. Now, then obviously you have the carpal tunnel, which can compress the median nerve. So you need to rule out all these areas of compression, but you don't need to do such a thorough examination that you have to examine each one of these individually, because the most common thing that can happen is a carpal tunnel syndrome. But you just need to be aware of these other sites of compression and what to look for that might indicate that these are happening at the same time. So the median nerve examination starts with inspection. So you want to inspect the whole hand first and compare both sides. So first thing you want to look for are scars. So you can see a scar from a previous carpal tunnel surgery if they have that. The other thing you want to look for are scars in the forearm from lacerations that could have injured the median nerve. And then you want to also look for scars here. This is where the abductor pollicis brevis inserts. And this is also the insertion point for any opponent's plasties that the patient might have had if they have had severe carpal tunnel syndrome in the past. The second thing you'll look for is muscle wasting and lumps and bumps. So look for any ganglions in the wrist that might be compressing the median nerve or anomalous muscles. And look at the thena eminence here for any wasting. Now, the abductor pollicis brevis, which is this muscle here, can be wasted and this becomes quite flat. This is the only muscle that's exclusively always supplied by the median nerve and results in abduction of the thumb and you can palpate that muscle here and that's where it is. This muscle is the opponent's pollicis and the flexor pollicis is here. The flexor pollicis is also supplied by the ulnar nerve so this might not be as wasted. And then look for scars as well here, the ring finger and the base of the middle finger. This can be donor sites using the FTS tendons for opponent's plasties. Look for a scar on the ulna side here, which could be a scar from a Huber transfer for an opponent's plasty. And then look for scars at the back of the index here and the wrist here, as this could be sites for the extensor indices opponent's plasty or the Burkhalter opponent's plasty. And you've looked for all their scars and you've looked for lumps and bumps, then you need to proceed on with your examination. So you start with sensation and you're looking for sensation at the radial three and a half fingers, which are the fingers supplied by the territory of the median nerve compared to the other side. And you can use 10, 10 examination. So what is this out of 10 and compare with this, obviously make sure they don't have any symptoms on the other side before you do that. Once you've examined the sensation of the median nerve, you then move on to the motor branch here. So the median nerve starts distally with sensation. And then if you just follow the nerve back, coming from the two common digital nerves, you will have branches going to the lumbricals. It's hard to examine the lumbricals in isolation because the intrinsics are supplied by the ulnar nerve. So don't worry too much about these lumbricals. The next is the recurrent motor branch of the median nerve and it goes into your thena eminence. And then the way you examine that is to resist abduction and you're examining this muscle here that you can see bulge up here and that is your abductor pollicis brevis 
and it's always exclusively supplied by the median nerve. That is the muscle to test for motor supply of the median nerve. The flexor pollicis brevis is here. The opponent's pollicis is here. And the flexor pollicis brevis is also supplied by the ulnar nerve and might still be working, so the patient might still be able to flex. And when you have very severe median nerve compression, this doesn't work very well, so the patient can't abduct. Now, the flexor pollicis brevis, which is a deep muscle, has two heads. It has a superficial head and a deep head. And the deep head of the flexor pollicis brevis muscle is also supplied by the ulnar nerve and can be only supplied by the ulnar nerve. Hence, a patient with very severe carpal tunnel syndrome or even a median nerve injury at the wrist might still be able to flex the thumb this way. So they can actually reach their little finger and you might think actually their thumb's okay. But what they can't do is actually lift their thumb up using the abductor. So when they can't lift the thumb up, they can't lift their thumb to position their thumb in space in order to be able to use it. So the operations that we do are in opponent's plasty. So an opponent's plasty basically acts more like an abductor plasty because the patient can still usually flex their thumb. So we are just lifting their thumb up so that they can flex it and use it. Because opponent opposition or opposition of the thumb is a combination of abduction and flexion. So when they can do both of these things, then usually it's okay. The next thing you examine when you go down there is the palmar cutaneous branch of the median nerve, which comes off about six centimeters proximal to your wrist crease and supplies the feeling to the thena eminence here. And the palmar cutaneous branch of the median nerve supplies sensation over your thena eminence. And it actually leaves the median nerve quite proximal, about six centimeters proximal to the wrist crease here. A lot more proximal than people think it is. So examine sensation here. And what does this mean? if you have reduced sensation in your thena eminence. What this means is the compression is not solely at the carpal tunnel. So this is one of the ways you can basically differentiate a more proximal compression to just a carpal tunnel syndrome. And it's a very quick way to examine the carpal tunnel to ensure that you're actually not missing something more proximal. So sensation over the thena eminence. If this is affected, you know the median nerve is being compressed further up and not just at the carpal tunnel. It might be double compression or what we call um, basically um, a double crush syndrome. So after you've done that examination, you want to proceed with some special tests. So you do a tinels, so tinels in the carpal tunnel. Look for any electric shocks and quite a firm tapping over the carpal tunnel. And the other test that is very sensitive is the Durkin's test. So that's just pressure over the carpal tunnel and it will recreate or exacerbate anesthesia or pins and needles or the thumb index middle and the ring fingers here and if that's positive then that's a good indication the patient does have clinical carpal tunnel syndrome or compression of the median nerve at the carpal tunnel after you've completed this examination you need to examine for more proximal sites of median nerve compression so the next place the median nerve can get compressed is down here at the fps arch so the flexor digitorum superficialis what this muscle does is it flexes the PIPJs of your fingers. So the flexor digitorum superficialis down here forms an arch between its two origins. And this is a very tight, firm fascial band, which is an arch where the median nerve dives through and can compress the actual median nerve. So it's somewhere here and you can tap here and look for a tinel sign here. And this can give you electric shocks if this nerve is involved. The way to actually clinically exam for this is to get them to take the middle finger and flex at the PIPJ and resist your extension, basically. What that does is it tightens up that FTS arch right in the middle and causes compression against the median nerve. And they will get paresthesia electric shocks going down their forearm when they have this problem. The next place it can be compressed is the pronator teres. So the two heads of the pronator teres, the median nerve goes between it. And you need to tense the pronator teres. How do you do that? you get them to resist supination. So you try to supinate and they will basically tense their pronator. So you can do it by just shaking the hand and getting them to pronate and supinate or just resist. You push their wrist, rotate their wrist into supination and ask them to pronate, okay? And that will basically give them the same symptoms and again, tap against the proximal forearm to get a tinels if there's an issue there. A branch coming off after the FTS arch is the anterior entrosis nerve. That supplies the pronator quadratus muscle as well as the FPL and the FTP to the index finger. So the way to examine for that is just to test the FPL and the FTP. 
And a common way to do that is to ask them to make an O sign. And they can't make an O sign if the anterior interosseous nerve is not working because you need flexion at the DIP joint at the index finger and the IP joint of the thumb. What they would do is this. So don't mistake this for an O sign because you can do this without a working anterior interosseous nerve. After you've completed your examination of the hand, with the median nerve in particular, and you've examined for proximal compression of the median nerve of the forearm, you need to think about the thoracic outlet and the neck. So you need to ask the patient if they've got any pain in the neck. And if you want to examine for the thoracic outlet, you need to do more thoracic outlet specific tests like the ruse test, which is arms in abduction and external rotation, and ask the patient to do that until they get fatigued or for three minutes. And the other test that you can do is the AdSense test, but you don't have to go specifically into these tests unless there's a problem there. But in your exam, if you mention, I will look for more proximal signs of median nerve compression, such as at the thoracic outlet or at the spine. Now, degenerative spinal disease usually affects the upper roots, so C5, C6, C7. So, and these are the upper roots, they form the upper trunk. And what that is, it forms the lateral cord and the lateral cord gives you the lateral contribution of the median nerve, which supplies more of the sensation of the median nerve, which is on the radial side of the hand. Now, when patients have ridiculous symptoms, so they've got compression at the spinal level, their symptoms go all the way down the radial side of the hand, not just confined to the three radial fingers here in the palm. So they'll complain of pins and needles and prosthesia here, but also they'll say, oh, it's aching down the radial side of my they won't say the radial side, but you know what I mean. The radial side of the forearm and the radial side of the arm. And it's going all the way down. Now, if patients complain of that, you have to be very careful and think, okay, it might not just be the carpal tunnel that's the issue here. And if I do a carpal tunnel release, they might not get full relief of their symptoms. So what these patients need perhaps is further investigations, like an MRI of the cervical spine. Sorry, to look for any degenerative disease or arthritis in the spine to ensure there's no compression there and, and just to make sure that they don't need referral further on to a spinal specialist. Sharpen, Masters of Surgical Education.